This is the second of our videos on Aquinas. Um, we're not actually going to start out talking about Aquinas, though. We're going to talk about Aristotle, who more than any other thinker had a great influence on Aquinas. Um, like I said in the last video, Aquinas' career is primarily a matter of adapting what Aristotle had to say to his time period, but also to Christian theology. So how is Aristotle important? Well, like I said before, natural law theory comes out of Aristotle, but it comes out of Aristotle in a kind of complicated way because Aristotle never talks about natural law or divine law. Um, uh, Aristotle didn't think there was any divine law. Um, and without divine law, it's a little peculiar to talk about natural law. Uh, and this is something we'll get back to in a little bit. But what Aristotle was mostly focused on was um, what was good for people. What made someone's life go better and the relationship between that or you know, might also just call it happiness, the relationship between happiness and virtue um, or especially virtues of character. Uh, this was what most ancient ethical thinkers uh, were concerned with. And Aristotle's fundamental insight was that what's good for people, what makes them happy, is the same thing that makes them a good member of their species. Or as it's sometimes said, what's good for man is to be a good man. Um, the idea is what makes you happy is determined by your nature. Um, what makes a dog happy is for a dog to live the best kind of life appropriate for a dog. What makes a human happy is um, to live the best kind of life appropriate for a human. And so you figure out what's good for people by looking at human nature. And what Aristotle tried to show was that virtue, especially acting virtuously, behaving virtuously, was just part of a happy life. Um, Aristotle is one of a number of thinkers who thought that the way to justify moral demands on people was just to point out that you're going to be unhappy if you break them. Um, the, only, the only reliable way to be happy, according to Aristotle, was to also be a good person. Now, we're not going to go through that argument. It's a very complicated argument. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about Aristotle's theory because it's going to help you understand what Aquinas' natural law is talking about. So the thing to know about Aristotle's theory is he, and here he's following an earlier philosopher, um, Plato, uh, one of Aristotle's teacher, um, who came up with this basic kind of argument. Aristotle just changed the details. What Aristotle um, thought was that you could look at the human mind and determine what kind of life would be good for human beings based on an understanding of not even really just the mind, but like human nature generally. And what he thought was the human soul. And soul for Aristotle just meant whatever it is in living things that allows living things to engage in behavior, right? So like Aristotle thought plants and animals all had souls, but rocks didn't. Rocks don't do anything on their own. Rocks don't move. They don't grow. They don't have what Aristotle called an interior principle of motion. Um, they just, they get acted on, but they don't do stuff themselves. But all living things do stuff themselves. And because of that, they have a soul. That's all having a soul meant for Aristotle. And so he said, you look at the soul of something. Right? You look at the principles that guide its behavior, and you'll figure out what a good life for that thing is. Now, he thought the human soul had three parts. One part, all right, so the soul can be broken up into three parts. One part is the nutritive part. This is the part we have in common with all plants and animals. Plants only have a nutritive part of their soul. It's just the part of the soul, according to Aristotle, that's responsible for taking in, you know, sustenance and growing. Um, procreation is uh, partly involved uh, or partly governed by this part of the soul. Because, of course, plants procreate, right? Plants reproduce. There's also what Aristotle called the sensitive part of the soul. 
And here he um, is talking about the part of the soul that we share with animals, but not with plants. Aristotle thought plants don't have a sensitive part of the soul. And what he means here is just plants or don't and animals do um, operate in the world. They move around in the world based on the information they take in about the world. So Aristotle thought plants just take in like food and water, um, you know, sunlight and soil and water and all that stuff. And then they grow. But animals, of which we're one, um, will not take in just that. We'll also take in information and we'll use that information to guide our behavior. In particular, we'll use that information to guide our behavior in accordance with our desires. Um, we want certain things and we take in information through our senses that allows us to go get those things. So we have a sensitive part of our soul. But unlike other animals, Aristotle thought we also had a rational part of our soul. And that was very important for Aristotle. It's what set us apart from animals. So everything distinctive about a good human life had to do with rationality. Um, uh, but it's not like those other parts of the soul aren't involved in living a good life, right? In order to live a good life, you have to, you know, eat well. You have to uh, be healthy, right? And that has to do with the nutritive part of the soul, but also to some extent the sensitive part of the soul. But Aristotle also thought you have to have, you know, your desires fulfilled, right? There's certain core human desires that um, we have based on our animal nature, and part of living a good life is having those desires satisfied. So when I said procreation involves the nutritive part of the soul, it also involves partly the sensitive part of the soul. Because, of course, animals, unlike plants, have a desire to engage in sexual activity. For the, and sexual activity is designed for procreation, right? Aristotle thought. And so procreation is involved in both of these parts of the soul. Now, the reason I'm focusing on procreation, or there's really two reasons. One is that Aquinas thought there were four fundamental um, drives that you had to keep in mind when you thought about what was good for people. Um, those four fundamental drives are uh, to preserve your own life, right? So we have um, drives, or you might call them purposes. Every human being has a purpose of preserving their own life. Every human being has a purpose of procreation. Every human being also has um, a purpose to live in society, or what you might call sociability. And, and this one is entirely contained within the rational part of our soul, every human being has a natural drive or purpose for knowledge. So these are the fundamental goods of four human beings. Staying alive, creating more human life, living together with other people. Um, Aristotle uh, pretty famously said human beings are necessarily social. Any animal that wasn't social would either be less than a human being or a god. Right? Um, human beings cannot live a good life alone, Aristotle thought. And then super distinctively of human beings, we have a desire to know. So if these are our fundamental drives and purposes, all of which Aquinas gets from Aristotle, which is why I opened up this up talking about Aristotle, then the natural law basically has four parts. And the four parts correspond to these purposes. Basically, the natural law says, don't do stuff that impedes these purposes or goals. So what would it be to impede the purpose or drive or goal of life? Well, killing people. So the natural law is going to tell you, don't kill people. Right? Um, don't do stuff that leads to people dying. That means don't murder people. It means don't commit suicide, right? All sorts of things. So this is where you get the part of the natural law that says don't murder people. Procreation. You should engage in, um, uh, or when you satisfy the desires coming out of the sensitive part of your soul, that are designed to facilitate procreation, you should do so in a way that will actually lead to procreation. Um, any of you uh, familiar with Catholic teaching on a lot of sexual ethics will be familiar with this idea. The idea that sexual activity should only be engaged in with the intent to have children. 
And so all kinds of sexual activity that can't lead to children, uh, and this includes, you know, all homosexual behavior, but also lots of heterosexual uh, sexual behaviors, are um, a violation of natural law. Right? Um, it's you using, according to Aquinas, your uh, natural desires, which are guided towards procreation for unnatural purposes, because the natural purpose is just procreation. Uh, highlighting this because this is the most common context in which natural law comes up nowadays, is discussing uh, sexual ethics. Um, that's, I think, quite unfortunate, um, uh, but I'm going to bring it up just so that you can understand how this issue relates to stuff that people actually talk about. Like you can go find people on Twitter or something like that talking about natural law, and they're usually talking about sexual ethics. Um, sociability means you just have to do the kind of stuff that allows, or the natural law, what the natural law has to say about sociability is you have to do the kinds of things that preserve society. Um, you're not allowed to do things that make living together harder. And so here's where you're going to get rules against telling lies, right? Because, you know, dishonesty breaks down social trust. Social trust is necessary for all sorts of social interactions. Right? Um, it's also where you're going to get duties to contribute to society, to, um, uh, you know, pay your taxes and things like that. That's going to come out of the fundamental driver purpose of sociability. And finally, knowledge. You need to contribute to the project of extending knowledge. You need to acquire more knowledge yourself, um, but you also need to support the institutions that you know help lead to knowledge. Um, so this is basically the content of the natural law. You're not allowed to use your own human nature, which is designed to pursue these goals, um, for other goals, right? You're not allowed to... Um, do things that harm life. You're not allowed to do things that harm the community. You're not allowed to do things that lead to greater ignorance. You're not allowed to uh, do things that don't lead to procreation. I mean, procreation is the weird one because, of course, all these other ones, it's kind of a constant thing. Like, you're never supposed to kill anyone. You're never supposed to do things that undermine society. You're never supposed to spread ignorance. But, of course, there's all sorts of times where you're not doing anything related to procreation. Um, like right now I'm recording a video and that doesn't have anything to do with procreation. Uh, so procreation is a weird one, uh, which we'll talk about, you know, uh, briefly at the end of this video, but this is the natural law, um, and virtues and vices. So the flip side of virtues, which are like good character traits to have are vices, which are bad character traits to have. What counts as a virtue and what counts as a vice is determined by these drives or purposes. And the natural law just basically tells you to respect these natural purposes and to guide your life in accordance with these natural purposes. Um, and so the question then arises, you know, uh, what should the law, the human law, have to say about this? Because here's the thing to realize about the natural law. When Aquinas is talking about natural law, what he's basically just talking about is morality. Uh, morality as something distinct from the actual laws that your government enforces, your government passes. Right? We're all familiar with this idea that something could be wrong, but the government allows you to do it. Um, probably the most common example is, um, well, I've been talking about lying a little bit. Uh, there's all sorts of dishonesty that we're legally allowed to engage in, right? Uh, if someone says, hey, were you at that party last night? And you say no, even though you were, you're not going to, unless like some particular business transaction is going on or something like that, you're not going to be legally punished for it. Um, law and morality are different, right? Uh, some things are right to do and the law prevents you from doing it, right? Or rather that's, you know, how we normally talk about it, as we're going to, as I told you about a little bit about last time, Aquinas doesn't actually think about it that way. Aquinas thinks any human law that contradicts the natural law isn't really a law. and You don't have to obey it. Um, but the natural law is morality, and the human law is what we just normally call law. And so a question arises. 
how much should the human law match the natural law? And Aquinas says, um, contrary to what you might have expected, that there's um, a lot of the natural law that the human law doesn't enforce. Because what Aquinas says is human law does not prohibit all vices. Just the fact that something is a violation of natural law does not mean it should be illegal, according to Aquinas. Or, to put it in more modern terms, just the fact that something is immoral does not mean it ought to be illegal. And Aquinas' reason is that basically it's too hard for most people to obey the natural law all the time, and that for some kinds of action, almost everybody is going to do the wrong thing, or at least the majority of people are going to do the wrong thing. And having a law that the majority of people are going to break is kind of pointless because you're not going to be able to enforce it. And all that's going to do is like reduce respect for the law in general, which is bad. And so there's all sorts of vices. There's all sorts of habits that lead us to violate the natural law that Aquinas says just shouldn't be against human law. Human law shouldn't forbid them. And the the key test for this seems to be two things. One, how likely are you to get everybody to do the right thing? There's some things that just you're not going to be able to get people to do, even though it's the right thing. And when you know that, when you know the law is kind of hopeless when it comes to um, uh, solving some problem, Aquinas thinks you just shouldn't have a law then, right? And you can you can make sense of this, right? Like he said, Human laws that violate the natural law are mere violence, mere acts of violence. Uh, all laws are a threat by the state to commit violence upon people. Well, that is, he said that in the context of human laws that violate the natural law. But what about cases where the human law matches the natural law, but it has no hope of achieving the goal? Right? To give you a concrete example, um, and here I'm going to return to the uh, issue of sexual ethics, right? Um, it is a violation of natural law, according to um, Aquinas' theory, for unmarried people to have sex. It's also a violation of natural law for married people above a certain age, right? Above the age where they can actually have children to have sex, right? So question, because in both cases, you're not trying to create a family. Um, it's actually more clear in the case of old people because they can't have kids that they shouldn't be having sex according to this theory than it is unmarried young people because, you know, if they do get pregnant, then they can get married. But basically any sexual activity that's not geared toward, that's not directed towards having children is a violation of natural law. Question, should it be made illegal? Aquinas' answer is going to pretty clearly be no. Because you're not going to be able to get people to stop doing it. Um, I mean, for one thing, how are you going to tell? Are you, are you watching everybody all the time? That's terrible. Um, but also, even if you were watching, they'd still do it. And so that's one of the reasons Aquinas gives to not make something against the law is the fact that making it against the law just won't do any good. If you can't achieve the goal of actually stopping the behavior then it does seem like the law is once again just an act of violence, right? It's violence to no purpose. When the human law is appropriate, it's a threat of violence geared towards a good purpose, a good purpose of preserving society, life, right? Uh, the continuation of life through procreation, the development of knowledge. When human actions or human virtues Right? When virtuous human action is demanded by the law, it's because it achieves some good result. If it can't achieve a good result, then all you're doing is throwing people in jail for no reason. Right? So that's one reason why you shouldn't um, ban all vices or make everything that's immoral also illegal, according to Aquinas. Another reason is that not all vices have anything to do with preserving human society. So basically what Aquinas is saying is that, whoops, this drive or purpose, sociability, the preservation of society, is particularly the goal of human law. Right? 
because he says the uh, virtues that tend towards the preservation of society um, and the vices are, can be commanded. The natural law can tell you you have to do good things if those good things help society. And vices also that undermine society can be forbidden. So he's talking about, for example, murder. You can, you can prohibit murder because that's a vicious action that actually helps destroy society. You can't have a society if you're afraid of being killed all the time, right? You're not going to leave the house. But some vices don't actually undermine society. Some vices don't break down social bonds. And they don't, you know, they don't kill anybody, right? Nobody gets seriously hurt. Um, uh, but they're nonetheless wrong, but not illegal. So Aquinas thinks human law should only demand virtues that contribute to a good society. Now, Aquinas does think that's going to be like basically all the virtues, but it should not prohibit any vices that society can survive with people still committing. And so, and that is apparently going to be quite a few kinds of vices. So there's all sorts of things that Aquinas says should be considered immoral because they violate the natural law, but shouldn't be illegal because the human law shouldn't match the natural law perfectly. And notice here that Aquinas is saying something that sounds very modern because he's saying that the state should not be the ultimate moral authority in two ways. One, he's saying if the state violates the natural law, you can ignore the state. The other way is that the state is just not supposed to concern itself with all sorts of private moral questions. Because the vices that negatively impact the ability of society to function are going to be those public vices. They're not really going to be private vices. If it stays private, then probably, not necessarily, but probably, it's going to be something that doesn't hurt other people. The vices that Aquinas is concerned with when it comes to human law are the vices that harm other people. Those can be forbidden, but vices that only hurt yourself right, or um, that don't tend to negatively impact other people, well, they're not okay. They're still vices. They're still wrong. But Aquinas does not think that um, the natural law or the, sorry, that human law ought to forbid it, that it's an overreach of human law to try to prevent uh, those behaviors. Um, and so, despite the fact that Aquinas was um, writing, uh, living and writing in the 13th century, right, 1225 to 1274 AD are his dates, and he's adapting a theory from Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, right, so we're talking uh, 700 years ago, more than 700 years ago, and like 2,300 years ago, he actually has a position that many, even historians, will try to say is a position when it comes to law and morality that is distinctively modern, but it's just not. The idea that law does not demand full morality and that law that... Um, that tells you to do wrong things can be ignored, right? that there's a higher authority than the state, is a theory as old at least as Aquinas, but Aquinas didn't really think he was breaking new ground here. Uh, you might notice in the Aquinas reading, he makes constant reference to earlier authorities, people like St. Augustine, who lived in the 400s AD, um, Isidore of Seville, uh, another um, Catholic thinker before him. So we um, hopefully, I've made the case that uh, this fundamental uh, idea about the distinction between morality and law is a very old one. And as we're going to see, it's going to be preserved with essentially every thinker we look at.